Okay, hi, hi everyone. Um, welcome to welcome to the uh, panel on LLMs and the web. I'm Andrew Tompkins. I'm the, the moderator for the panel, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna kick off now. I, I think so. Maybe just a couple of uh, words on format. Then we'll do a quick round of introductions, and then we're gonna jump right in. We have about one one hour. Um, there's uh, uh, the the way that language modeling is kind of integrating into different sectors of the economy and different parts of, of society. It's, uh, it's so early right now that predicting where it's going to go seems like um, a fool's errand in, in some ways. Like almost certainly you'll be wrong. And so we're going to encourage the panelists to do exactly that. And uh, it'll be with high variance probably the results. That means that we'll spend some time covering questions that are very much in the, in the common discourse right now about what happens with LLM safety, what happens with uh, generative AI to give uh, responses in, in line. Um, and then we'll also cover some areas that are much more speculative and we're not really sure where, where things are going in terms of the dynamics of, of, uh, of, of the web, web creation, web, web consumption. Um, in terms of logistics, we, we have a set of questions that we've all had a very lightweight discussion about that we'll use to kind of seed discussions and uh, then at, at uh, various points along the way, uh, we'll kind of reach out for audience commentary, questions, thoughts, responses to things that we've, uh, we've brought up. I see there's a microphone right here and a, and a microphone right here. So if you have some questions in mind, or if you're thinking now and, and want to come up with some, some questions, please do. Please come to the microphone and we'll, we'll try to work it into the discussion. And uh, at some points we'll do maybe some direct outreach. So with that, um, maybe uh, I can turn to our panelists to do a quick uh, self-introduction. Chia, would you like to start? Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm Andrew. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I, I'm working at Google. I've, I've been working in, in um, uh, sort of uh, the, the web and related questions uh, for, for uh, most of my career, I, I, I guess, and, and uh, have been touching questions of machine learning at Google now more, more recently. And so with that, I'll pass to uh, Jie. Okay. So my name is Jie Tang from Tsinghua University. So uh, recently, we just worked on large language model. And uh, this morning, actually, I introduced our model, ChatGM, and also GM4. So yeah, that's my, yeah. I'm going to go longer because I'm older, right? And, and actually, Andrew forgot to mention that he's a, one of the Test of Time uh, Award uh, winners. I had to mention it because it doesn't do self-promotion. So kudos, because he had, if you had never read the Bowtie papers, paper, well, I, uh, Wendy will know when we, uh, when did you win it? In 2007? 17. 17, you know, who counts? Anyway, so that was Andrew. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Joel Marek. I'm a chief researcher at the Technology Innovation Institute uh, out of Dubai, oh, sorry, Abu Dhabi, uh, but I'm based in Israel. Uh, I'm working on AI and information retrieval uh, uh, challenges, um, and especially on a retrieval augmented generation on top of a Falcon that GA forgot to mention today. I have to mention it. And you have the lead of Falcon, Hakim, my colleague, somewhere in the crowd, so he's going to be very upset with you. <laughs> uh, but seriously, and pre before, uh, before turning like everyone else to uh, LLMs, obviously, uh, long career in, uh, in search, in information retrieval, CIGAR, uh, the web conference wisdom. Uh, before, so I was at Amazon Research. I was a VP there for the last uh, six years before TII. Then I was, uh, before that, I was at uh, Yahoo, where I overlapped with, uh, with Andrew. Before that, I was at Google. And before that, I was at, uh, at IBM for, where I overlapped maybe a little bit with you, John. And to you now. All right, thanks, and I'm Sean Kleinberg. I'm a professor at Cornell University, and um, I guess I'll be uh, following Jia's great keynote this morning with a, a talk tomorrow morning where um, I've, yeah, I've interest, been interested in these problems faced by large platforms, the social and information networks that underpin them, the web information that they have to manage, the social and economic dynamics that come up with the user populations, and uh, all of these things are obviously incredibly well, well re represented at the web conference, which is, you know, I, I think what makes it such a, you know, such an important place to, to bring all these topics together. Great. Okay, so let's jump in. 
Um, we have this this fantastic set of, of uh, uh, panelists covering so much so much ground, and so I think we'll get a good uh, good diversity of, uh, of of opinion here. So um, my my first question, and I wonder if maybe Jia could sort of take the first uh, stab at it, is um, websites right now um, they're consumed sort of through browsers, through through HTML, through phones. Um, there's, there's the possibility that much of the material that's served from websites could be served through LLMs. And here I'm talking about LLMs that are managed by the website uh, owner or the or the provider in some way. So uh, I guess the question is like, do we expect that websites will have kind of LLM-based natural language front ends to their content? And uh, if, if so, sort of like, how will this happen? What is the what is the time frame? What will it mean for traffic? What kind of technologies will be will be used? Maybe we can start with a discussion about whether this will be a new consumption modality for the web. Yeah, thank you for asking for about this. So personally, I think it's quite possible. I mean, probably in the future. So today, just like we talk about it, so maybe we could have something like a web OS operating system. And each, uh, each website probably have an uh, agent, you could say. So the agent can communicate with the human being and also interact with, with the other agent as well. So, so probably just like yesterday, actually, we discussed with John. So maybe in the future. So different agents will also communicate with each other. And that's probably constructed the virtual space. And also we have the social space, like a human being. So the agent will communicate with the, the human, and the human being will also communicate with the, the agent, and also agent communicate with each other. So somehow like that, yeah. So that's, I think that would be interesting. And technically, I think probably we can use the all tools or agent ability to develop such kind of agent very quickly. So for example, like GPT already use GPTS, to develop the different like uh, app, so that's uh, somehow somehow quite easy actually. So I think that that is a way to develop the sense. Okay. Great. Hey, anybody else want to? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So so you know if I go back to what you you were, you were saying, Andrew, if uh, the content itself is generated by LLMs, and we know that most at least the open source uh, LLM they all used uh, some you know cleaned up version of the web to train themselves. And now if the major, I mean, we, we have to be a little bit careful about the fact that we are going to generate more data that's going to be used to actually train more LLM that generate more data. We have to be a little bit worried about doing, uh, you know, the rich get richer kind of uh, um, suffering for the rich get richer kind of syndrome that we learn on the same thing all the time and generate the same kind of things. And that worries me a little bit, so that would be one point, you know, would we need some guardrails? If everything is in synthetic, and then where do we learn from, right? And so that's, we, we need to think about it. So maybe we need, I don't know what the solution for that, if we need, you know, diverse LLMs rather than one big one. And the second thing, uh, and I will keep saying that for every topic today, um, is that hallucinations exist. And actually, if uh, some of you, uh, I don't know if Mohan is here, but yesterday he gave an excellent uh, talk at, uh, uh, in the LLM day. Hallucination is inevitable. He actually demonstrated it formally. So for those who didn't see it, you, you, should, you should look at it. Which means that not only are we going to learn from things that are synthetic, but we know that they will hallucinate because they have to. That's by design, that is formal proof. And so you could say that the same thing for today, you know, human-generated content. But at least we don't know it. But this time we know it, that it's wrong. So, you know, always keep that in mind. A lot of uh, synthetic data, a lot of hallucinations, and we are, I'm not sure we know how to protect ourselves from that. So what does it mean for the future of the web, right? Yeah, I, I think it's the, the question of whether this becomes an interface to the web, to web information is... I feel like sort of central to all, all, the whole question of how LLMs will protect the web. I, if I go back to a, a point from your, uh, the start of your keynote, yeah, about like what is the most popular application on the web, you know, it would be search because there's information out there. But then the question is like, what is search? And we sort of think search is, you know, as Prabhakar Raghavan, you know, famously said, like the mapping of two, 2.3 keywords to 10 blue links. But 
search doesn't have to be that, right? Like that's kind of the construct we made up because that's what search engines could do. Presumably search is actually about answering your questions. Um, but then we get into this problem, which is um, we get into this problem that if it's just this thing is sitting there answering your questions, um, search has always had this kind of implicit agreement with the creators of content that it'll interpose itself between the user and the content, but it will drive traffic to that content and the creators will benefit because it, it helps them get found. There's a, a kind of quid pro quo that's going on, right? The, the search engine interposes itself, but they get found more easily. If it's ingesting and just reporting answers back, we're gonna need a different model for distributing the utility because it, it can't collect all the utility for itself, then there'll be no incentive to create content. And that gets back to your point about, you know, in the end we're gonna still need humans creating content so that we have something to train on and there needs to be some incentives for that to happen. If I can take so plus one, a strong plus one to what you're saying. Having just a pure, you know, perfect question answering, I don't think it's going to satisfy satisfy anyone. Even if the, if it's not hallucinating, we we need to feel reassured that there is something behind. So I, I do think, you know, and as a you know 30, 30 year search person, that search is here to to stay, but it needs to tango and to dance some, somehow with the LLMs so that you have both of them to give us the feeling, a little bit of feeling of um, of not ownership, but being able to judge the content. Okay, LLM says that, I have answers from search, how do I play with both? We need to be careful not to go in just in one direction. I, I totally agree with you. Great, oh, okay, so, so we're, we're starting to build this picture here about um, uh, websites that could be accessed via website-specific agents um, that could potentially provide responses to certain kinds of incoming questions. And then Jess sort of gave this picture of maybe this agent landscape. Now if you, if you have um, LLMs at the websites that are capable of responding to any question, suddenly the agents that exist operating on behalf of us users, um, they, they can potentially go to query any website via natural language, like actually ask a question and, uh, and get like a considered response back and reason about it. So in, in a sense, that sort of means that the, the transport layer of the network, um, rather than thinking about sort of every website implementing its own custom protocol or exposing its own APIs that need to be integrated in a bespoke manner into a user agent, suddenly this uh, network allows an agent operating on your behalf to go and talk anywhere on the web using natural language as the sort of universal encoding for it. So that gives us sort of a, a view of a set of agents operating at this level. And then what John and Yoel were talking about on top of that is now a set of agents that are maybe operating across websites, either because they are platform providers that will provide some sort of federated search of, of uh, many websites the way big search engines do today, um, or possibly because there are platforms providing capabilities across multiple websites for the website. So I, I guess um, uh, maybe what I wanted to, to ask about this is um, uh, going back to uh, a question that John raised from the early days on the web about whether the web would tend to move towards a number of specialized search engines versus one big search engine that's aware of, of everything or a, or a small handful of them. Maybe we can now kind of talk about the same question from the standpoint of, of this network of agents. Do we expect sort of consolidation into a handful of providers that have deep expertise in managing these things and what would that look like from an economic standpoint? Or do we expect tools that become very broadly distributed? And how about from the user side? Um, maybe we can uh, discuss that briefly, and then we'll pop ourselves up to the economic level to talk about how uh, content creation might be incented in this, in this kind of a world. Um, would anybody like to start on, on this one? Just to do, before John say the smart thing, I'm just going to say the old thing. Uh, if you guys remember, anyone remember Waze? Thinking machines, oh, Wendy, of course. Oh my God, say something about us. So what, what actually, 
<laughs> what actually Andrew was referring to, if you remember before Google, before Excite, before Yahoo, before Lycos, I don't think these guys even remember Lycos, um, there was the thinking machines, wide area information system, white A, what was the A? Whether yeah. information and, and this was the idea of having a federated search engine where every website would actually uh, have their own index and just serve it and then it would be federated. It died and then you know we had like big players coming. And the question that you're asking, Andrew, is it going to should we revisit this model? My gut feeling that um, it cannot be what it should be a combination. Ideally, it should be a combination of the two. You might want to have, you know, um, some agent, some local, you know, question answering system using an LLM that is, has been trained on the entire web, but it needs, you know, I'm a strong believer in RAG. You would have always like proprietary, maybe, you know, behind the scenes protected uh, content that is today is not surface, not crawled and not surface in Google, but with RAG and LLM, suddenly you could surface it. So maybe it would be for the better, but you need to orchestrate all that and that's not going to be trivial. So that's my, just my gut feeling. Yeah, I, I mean, this is such an old question from the web about are things going to fry, you know, are we gonna need specialized search for many things? Is it going to be global? And it also feels so topic specific, right? I mean, I would guess that the way that you search for, you know, information about flights, you know, air, airline flights might be different from how you search about, you know, so, so for some things, generic search works well for you, and for some other things, you know, you might actually want something where you can configure various things and search in a, in a specialized language. So it may ultimately be topic, topic dependent. Uh, the other thing is, it's not clear the question is, so easy to actually figure out even once you see things play themselves out or even necessarily well-defined. I mean, I actually think back to something that uh, um, Uris Hartmanis said in a very, very different theoretical context, which is dust covers are cheap, by which he meant I can take a bunch of different computer programs or, you know, and I can put a giant dust cover over them and make it look like one computer, but it's actually like eight different things that are all running, doing different functionalities. And somewhere there's a thing switching between those functionalities, right? So I put up a web page with a little box and an interface, but whether that's a single functionality or a very complicated switching system that's actually switching between what the engineers know is really eight distinct functionalities may not always be apparent. And so the question of fragmentation or consolidation is partly a technical question, but also in some sense partly a UI question, partly an economic question as to exactly what it means for it to be consolidated. Okay, so uh, yeah, actually this morning uh, after, after a talk, so I, actually I, I have some discussion with Wendy, so uh, this actually gave me some kind of inspiration. So I'm thinking about the evolution of the web. So before we could say that the web actually is, a, is a, you could say a network of web pages or you could say a link of something like a, like, a, like a pages or information. And, uh, and after that, we, we have the linked data, or you could say linked data basically is a link of semantics or knowledge, knowledges. And now, probably in the future, we have AI, and each AI, you, you can consider each AI as an agent or something like that. And each AI is responsible to answer in such kind, some kind of questions. And maybe we have a linked AI, or some, somehow like a linked agent. So the point is that because on the web, the point is that we, we, have, to, we have to find the target information for each question. You, you don't need to find the information sources. Actually, the point is find the information. So probably in the future, it's not to search for the web page, not to search for the knowledge. Probably is, is the, the goal will be search for the AI. So that probably is the point. So different AI, and we search for the AI, the AI is responsible for answering the questions. So, yeah, probably, I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, some kind of future. Skynet, right? That's great. Um, okay, so we've, we've um, covered a lot of ground in terms of the way that uh, uh, access to the web may evolve as these new tools sort of come into play at many different layers of the of the stack. Um, we can maybe like move on to talking about the uh, the economic and incentive structures here. 
But if, if anybody would like to kind of throw in some additional thoughts or ask some additional probing questions about this, this is maybe a good time. So please feel free to, to come to the microphones if you'd like to, either now or uh, any, any point along the way. Um, okay, so, so maybe um, with, with that, I wonder if we could talk about um, uh, kind of, of uh, content creation. That um, uh, the, the web is, is sort of special because it has such beautiful um, pages where somebody has kind of gone through all the work of, of thinking about like all the different places in, in Asia where you could spend a weekend and, and uh, brought uh, their expertise to bear and created a funny and detailed and, and thoughtful exposition that will guide people in, in uh, 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 taking a weekend trip, say. And uh, we would love for that person to receive the benefit of all the value creation and all the, um, uh, the outcomes of people going to resorts and spending money. Uh, and, and, and we have sort of a means of doing that through advertising that is driven like a, a, a ton of, of uh, uh, kind of people managing human creativity and, and like pushing it out to a, a potentially very large audience. Now, the model's changing and we have to kind of understand like what what are the approaches that could lead to thriving content ecosystems where people are doing the same sort of thing in the future of AI. So maybe maybe I could ask the panelists and maybe I'll maybe I'll start with John this time, kind of what are the possible models that that could be successful for the for the future web? Yeah, it's a great question. And I would say that it isn't just that we, someone who has these extremely engaging takes on places you could visit and the thoughts, it's not just that in some normative sense they deserve to be compensated, but also if there's not some reward, many of them won't do it, right? It, it's sort of a, a leap to say that the web's always gonna be powered by just the altruism of people who just want to create content. You know, that may or may not work, you know, as an empirical question, but it, it feels like we want to uh, have a way that this, this does get recognized. I think it also, your example is a good reminder that, you know, search is not always about finding the answer, right? That the answer was out there and we've distilled it. It's also sometimes about understanding the landscape, right? The, the question of like, where should I spend a weekend, you know, in, you know, at a, a conference in, in, in Asia. It's not that there's the answer and now we found it. I actually wanted to hear these, these different takes on it and people are, are going to generally disagree. And, it, we sort of know empirically that a large amount of searching consists of that, in fact. Um, so I do think like if we move to an LM sort of as an interface, as something answering the questions, it's not just going to be about finding these sort of succinct nuggets that have been distilled. Sometimes the answer is complex. Sometimes the answer is actually an enumeration. And in those situations, it should know to do an enumeration. And I think, you know, having economic models that say like there's some value that was produced by this answer and we're now allocating the value across this, this, this chain of production is a, a, a very interesting kind of question. You know, I guess it's a question um, that you know, I think a lot of us have been thinking about. It, it was already sort of implicit in some of the early social media, right? So there was this word like mashup, right? Um, which you know, is sort of kind of a 2005 era word. I think Google Maps was often the thing being mashed up with something in 2005. And again, the, the question was, as people create content and it gets combined into a, a, a single artifact, you know, can we, can we take the economic surplus being created there in crass terms and then ask about sort of how to attribute it back across this tree that built up to it? Okay. So you always inspire me, John. So I, I was just thinking of, of something. Both of you mentioned that actually, you know, there are these people who write beautiful websites and they, they want to have some reward for that, which is correct, but you know, let's not be too naive. We know that the majority of websites are automatically generated. And you know, it's a little bit, I don't know if we have a, a Airbnb uh, researchers here, so I don't want to, to offend them, but you know, once Airbnb were like individual private people, but many, many, you know, many times now they are actually, you know, regular, you know, professional, and it's not the same feel as when it's a true person hosting you. And it's a little bit the same thing with, with the web today. We do have these, you know, jewels of the web where we have real people who wrote their travel blog and it's super inspiring and some that are, you know, and then we have so much on that. I mean, you, you the bow tie person, you should know how the proportion, but I think it's, in, it's, in, 
It's a majority of web content now, it's automatically generated. So I'm actually contradicting myself, you know, what's the difference? Because today, you know, you have all these uh, synthetic content already, but maybe it's less obvious. And to go back to your, to, to your point, you know, how to, re, to, um, to share the benefits, because it cannot be a, a single economy, you're absolutely right, it will not, never survive. But maybe if we go to this dream we were discussing before of a, a renewed, a revived ways where you would have specialized rack supported LLMs at different places. And if one LLM actually generates information from a rag engine of another website, so here you need to have, you have a transaction. And so, but it might mean as, at the same time that some of the content will be hidden. So the, the trade-off, you could have an economic, uh, you know, um, reward, but it means that part of the data will be accessed only and will be hidden uh, behind a kind of firewall. And then, so it, it's not the open web we are all dreaming of that has, but, it, but maybe it's too late in any case because it has already disappeared. So, you know, something to think about. So, you know, the big economists, they, you, sh you guys should think about, you know, some mechanism design or some uh, new models to make that work. But I do think that with several agents, what you like, uh, GA, it could work if you, if you have a protocol. And maybe it's a new, new role for the web, you know, we need to reinvent new protocols because we, we stopped doing that for, you know, in a long time. I don't know, what, what do you think? Uh, yeah, yes, you have a good point. So, yeah, I'm not sure, but yeah, I'm still thinking about it. So what we really want from the web? So because, uh, yeah, so, yeah, yesterday, I, actually, I, I said probably search engine is the most important thing, but on the other hand, actually, the people actually only want to digest some kind of information on the web. So, for example, like uh, TikTok and uh, like, uh, like in, in China, ByteDance actually is the most popular APP. So people actually go there, they didn't search, they just uh, consume the information and wh whatever the information, so probably pop up some kind of information and just uh, go down uh, or something like that. So, so in this way, I'm thinking about it. Maybe in the, on the other hand, uh, I mean, from another angle, I'm thinking about it. So maybe in the future, like the, the, the large language model maybe generate some kind of like, uh, like information to the user and uh, the user just, uh, just uh, goes through all the information one by one and all the information probably just generated from the from the language model, compiling the different information, but personalized. So that is another angle. I want, you want to say something? Yeah. I, I want to disagree with you because first we, we are supposed to be to disagree. But besides, I really want to disagree because if that's the future, it's it's gloomy, right? And and I want to believe what you were saying, John, that we want serendipity, people, you know, it's a journey. You're planning for a trip. If I have a perfect guide, you know, my personalized Lonely Planet coming to my phone, no, it's, I, I love this journey, you know, searching, trying, because then, I, you know, it's like if I'm biking, I have a colleague who always uh, talks about that here, you know, if it's biking or walking, I, I own it. If, if I'm driven, it's not the same thing. So here, if you digest all the information for me, it's not mine anymore. So I, I want to believe that you're wrong. <laughs> Otherwise, the future is gloomy. Probably we can ask how many people. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Should, we, should we take a vote? <laughs> yeah, you, you can try that. Um, yeah, let's, let's take a quick straw poll. Um, I think this would be a great point to have some sense of. How many people believe in uh, Jia's um, possible view in which uh, there's actually sort of like a very um, uh, clean post-processing presenting kind of a unified view of data versus uh, Yoel's uh, um, maybe like uh, anti-gloomy perspective on, on whether we might spend our time kind of uh, um, actually exploring like very different uh, takes on these things. Who feels that the future may look more like the kind of curated view that Jiao is discussing? Is that a prediction or what people want? I mean, oh yeah, prediction, know, prediction. I think he's um, right, but I, I don't want him to be right. <laughs> okay, who's in the Jia camp? I'm, I'm going to evaluate that as what do you what do you predict? What do you think things will, will look like? It's two questions. Yeah. What do you predict, and then what do you want? Yeah. What What do you predict? What What do you think the future will look like? How many people think fully curated, and maybe how many people on the other side think uh, more broadly distributed? Oh, interesting. 
uh, okay, I think we actually have a winner for the for the more broadly distributed. And and uh, <laughs> finally, what would what what do people think is is the future that you would like to see? How many people would like the the curated future whose quality might be very high? Ravi, good. And, um, <laughs> and how many people feel that? Um, Access to diverse range of uh, per perspectives is the way to go. And here, there's maybe like some broad, some broad uh, uh, agreement. And we'll see if the market will will hear this. Yes. How do we fight for that? Yep. Okay. Great. Um, John. I mean, I mean, since we were talking about the economic models for all of this, that, like the elements bring up also the question of economic models. You know, when we think about sort of how it's curating things or how it. Economic models for things that we don't really have economic models for right now, right? So, like, say for example, you know, you're an aspiring, let's say, you know, pop artist, or you're an aspiring stand-up comic, you know. And so, as an aspiring stand-up comic, what you've done is you've watched videos of your favorite stand-up comic, just picture your own favorite one, and you've memorized every one of their routines, and you've gotten all the mannerisms down, the tone of voice, and then you go and you do that, and you know, and, and you get very popular. And at first, you're just completely derivative of this person, and it's kind of a little embarrassing, but you get more successful and you develop your own style, right? Effectively, that is an LLM, right? The LLM has gotten incredibly good, like it just memorized all these people and exactly how they talk down to the last little nuance. And, but eventually it somehow has some, and so in the offline world, that stand-up comic who memorized everything does not owe royalties to their, their, their hero from the stand-up comedy world. They don't have to pay them for having watched all their videos and gotten really good. Um, with LLMs, we sort of feel like maybe there is some, but it's, I think it's worth asking why do we view those two situations differently when at some level there's an analogy between them. Very nice. Um, so comments, anybody want to weigh in on this argument about economic uh, models for, for, for the web? I'll pause just for a minute in case anybody wants to get up and come to a, to a microphone. Uh, the first is the hardest, but it looks like maybe Natasha. Great. So I was wondering if we could broaden the incentive question a little bit, because as I think you all mentioned, you know, some of that is economic. I want to get paid. There's all the journalism aspect of it. But also, I think people generate content, like there are other incentives, right? I want to have pluses or stars on Reddit or on TripAdvisor, and people contact me. So again, if we have a highly curated or sort of extra layer that sort of hides that personal aspect of it and that personal reward that a lot of people get, how do we get around that sort of, that's an additional layer of incentives that I think is worth discussing. I'm wary of talking twice in a row because that, violates an important heuristic for being on panels, but <laughs> since no one else is talking. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, it, it suggests a very interesting kind of mechanism, I think, which I, I think is what your question is hinting at, that you could imagine there being kind of scores where it's literally the LLM training that actually issues likes to people, right? Like it, it, it says like, here's how much I, w I actually built it. And you could imagine that becoming something people effectively, you know, sort of motivates people. Um, effectively like a Google Scholar citation count for how much like the, the, the thing drew on you. Um, I think it, it, it's very interesting. I mean, downstream we could ask the Goodhart's Law question of whether that then becomes self-fulfilling where people now author content precisely in the hope that it gets ingested into the LM because they get this reciprocal reward. But I feel like usually you worry about the Goodhart's Law's questions downstream once the measure actually starts succeeding. It, in the first phase, it's a, yeah, it's a very interesting kind of... So um, I, I kind of want to raise a couple of questions about privacy, trust, and, and safety. Um, but but with, with that established as a goal, one, one quick thing maybe we can just touch on uh, before, before we get there, which is crawling. So crawling has, has kind of been, um, uh, it's a big industry. There's, there's a lot of resources from websites that go to serving pages to, to bots in order to create maybe like search engines or other derived data that might wind up reciprocally kind of driving traffic back to the, uh, to, to the site. And in some sense, this is an artificial page view that might lead to a real page view, right? So I guess we're sort of, um, uh, we're saying that a couple of things might be changing. One is that 
the, um, the nature of the content might actually be partly backed by um, uh, like traditional content, ecosystem created content, but partly also kind of with a layer of, of sort of generative AI on, on top of it. And so the things coming out of the website might look different. The things asking for access to the website might look different. We have users, we have, we have um, crawlers uh, operating on, on behalf of, of somebody else. But maybe now we have other agents also that are kind of like checking in on the website to say like, oh, my user is very interested in flights. Have, they, have the prices changed? Is anything new? Is there something that I should be recommending to them? And this represents potentially like a third class of traffic to places on, on the web. So I'm curious uh, what the panelists think about how this, uh, this future might go and if it uh, has implications for uh, sort of resource management and also for the nature of the content that the rest of the world can perceive, which used to be quite uniform, but in the future may not be. So, 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 so yeah, yeah, I, I see totally your point. Oh, you, you, you want to answer that, yeah? Okay. So as I think if you think uh, of um, sharing the, the wealth, right, with, with, as you were saying, with, search, with web search engines, because we would bring traffic back eventually, people didn't protect their website with uh, robots.txt too much because eventually, even their crawl, they would get some benefits. It was in their interest to open the doors. Here, we know that things are being crawled, let's say, by common crawl, and then someone else is going to use it, and it's, you don't know for what it's going to be used, and you won't get the traffic back. So that's an issue here. However, if you have this agent that's going to answer agent requests, so then now it's a different type of traffic. As, and it's, I think it's uh, what we were going through, you know, this idea of ways and new, uh, new uh, economic mechanisms. But it's going to cost way more money to the provider because if I need, you know, on my website to, um, to do an inference, it's costly. It's, you know how much it costs. It's costly. AWS is going, or you know, Azure or Google Cloud are going to be happy, but it's costly. And then I should probably you know, reflect the cost back already. It's not only how much benefit, it's also how much expenses are going to be incurred. So we need to think, in, you know, it's going to be so complicated that if we don't define a, a kind of protocol, I think it's going to, I don't see that evolving naturally as, yeah, as a web, you know, everything work naturally. And maybe Wendy was saying before, you know, we need, what, we need to fight, we need to do stuff to you. But maybe this community think, needs to think about protocols that will support that. Because otherwise, I don't see how a natural evolution is going to support it. Don't you think so? I don't know. I'm, I'm just brainstorming. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, personally, probably this depends on in the future, how we, I mean, interact with the information space itself. So because I'm, I'm just thinking about it. So actually so far, if we search and we find some target information, so that is somehow like, uh, we could say the web is somehow possibly interactive with the human being because they just, the, the information space is just the, like the, over there and we search and they basically they, they get some question and answer. But in, if in the future is somehow like a, the web is itself probably actively, or you could say proactive interactive with the human being. So maybe, in, in, I mean, from that perspective, the web itself is somehow like a, like a, mm, I'm, I mean, like an assistant, like a personal assistant is rather than information itself. I mean, I mean, in terms of that, so, I mean, Probably the web will, will totally change. I have no idea about it, what, what it will be, which way will be corrected, but I'm just thinking about that. Yeah. So, what's your opinion? I, mean, I, I guess I would, I, would, I would say this question is a little bit orthogonal to large language models, as in the idea that I'm going to have agents going out issuing sort of queries on my behalf, personalized to me. Your example of like, have the prices on flights changed? has this researcher published a new paper that I should know about, right? We have these kinds of alerts, notifications, personalized filters. And so I think what's interesting with LLMs is it, 
it dramatically increases the functionality. But it, it does suggest that maybe if we're trying to look for how this may play out, we could look for the domains where this is already relatively effective, right? So like a lot of us, you know, maybe do have article alerts on Google Scholar for certain kind of matches. We sort of understand a bit how that works. We might have like personalized price alerts for things because the, the information there is structured. Um, and so I, th I think like looking to that as maybe a sort of pilot case for what ultimately LLMs might be able to do for much more unstructured information on the web might be a useful guide to how this could play out. Um, audience questions or comments uh, before we move on? Oh, great. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I have a couple of questions that haven't really been touched on yet. We've talked about compensating uh, the creative efforts of users. Um, but one of the issues now is who actually owns the user and who, 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 not the content creator, but the actual user of the system itself. Creative companies like Google, advertising companies, make their revenue by profiling their users. How does that fit into an LLM? Uh, does, that, does that same process take place? Um, and a whole other question is, would a thousand of us come to a conference to hear all sorts of papers that bots have written on our behalf, right? There's probably a little bit of that going on already, but if, if you really look at the creative process, right, what is it, what's an information exchange? And you know, in, in the very nice presentation this morning, I was struck by all of the examples were very trivial in terms of what was being created and what was being analyzed. I remember this picture of a guy with a chicken coming at him, and the comment was a man and a chicken, which didn't explain anything about what was really going on. So that, that um, so they're, they're two separate issues, right? If, when we lose trust in, in um, the reflective power of an LLM to really talk about, to provide you an answer that, that understands the context, right? Does that make it interesting? And, and if we use all of this, who's gonna pay for this technology? Is it gonna be the kind of payment, indirect payment that we have now where the value exchange is, I give you all my personal information, you monetize that, and you give me some services in exchange? Is, is, does that model extend into the future of this new models of content creation? So either one of those are things that I'd like to hear some comments on. Great, who, who has thoughts on these? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for, for asking about this. So, so yeah, uh, I'm not sure about the, what the, uh, like a commercial model of the large language model. So probably similar to the, uh, like a web search, because actually if you get a user, basically you can do some, something like advertisement or something like that, but maybe not. So, so for example, we can use a membership or some other way, like a chat GPT. But it, mm, yeah, that's the first way. But actually nobody, I guess no company is really gets some money from, from based on the large language model. But it, well, on the other hand, actually, is about the trust of the of the large language model itself. So, so uh, personally, I, I still think about it. So, the AI is somehow still trying to improve the performance. Until now, uh, I don't think it's really trustful or something like that. But they were trying to improve the quality. So, I, I, I think there is a threshold. So, if a user trust uh, think that the, the quality is already past the threshold. So the user basically trusted the large language model or trusted the AI. So the AI generated content will just be value, be of value to the users. So I think that is the most important thing. But if the if the, the, the accuracy is still lower than the threshold, so 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 it's yeah, the user will just use the search engine to see that okay, I find an information source and I digest the information by myself. So so that's my yeah. Um, you asked a hard question, Dick, as usual. But I was, and I was also in the same presentation with the, the, the reasoning example, right, about uh, the chicken and the man. I think these are illustrating examples. And if these are like trivial things that a human can do, people won't use the, the LLM. I mean, the, you know, the, you know, 
the proof is in the pudding. People will not use it if it doesn't bring them value. And I think we are still in the infancy of complex uh, reasoning. And all the examples that we're seeing are kind of trivial. What we want the LLM to do is give us stuff that we cannot you know, infer automatically. And, and these two trivial examples won't generate traffic, so they will die. I hope so, that there will be a natural evolution. But regarding your, your, the, the economic model, it's true that, you know, in the early days of the web, what brought, brought value on top of IR in, in web search? It was hubs and authorities, it was page rank, that's how it started. And then um, it evolved to usage data, the clicks, that's what brings you the, you know, the implicit vote. I haven't seen that actually generalized to LLMs. I don't see the role, the implicit vote, role um, of users' traffic bringing better value. Maybe it's a new area of research to, to explore. You, you, you mentioned you know, the negative part that actually uh, usage data is being cannibalized to, uh, to make profit for big companies. But on the other hand, the implicit vote of users give, a, give us a more democratic web. Um, so two things to, from what you're saying. I would say first, yes, we need an economic, economic model. I'm not an economist. I want to hope that it will um, emerge naturally. That, and then the incentive will emerge naturally, and then what makes, brings the most value to the majority of the population will be the winning one. I hope for that. If that doesn't happen, maybe we need uh, the community to unite and, and define protocols that will facilitate it. That's how we'd look at it. But actually, you gave me an idea that maybe for the researchers here in this, uh, in this conference, we should start thinking about whether we can um, you know, be inspired by what usage data gave to web search for LLMs, because today it's not happening. And maybe it will bring added value. Just, just a thought. Yeah, thanks for the question. Actually, on the other part of your question about sort of the role of human creativity, or would we come to a conference to see papers that were generated by LLMs? I mean, I think in that sense, LLMs, like every powerful tool in the past, is kind of a provocation to us as humans, which is to ask, what is the value that we are adding, right? If we look at something and we say, I am frustrated because, you know, an LLM produced this thing that once upon a time a person would have written, I think you also have to ask yourself, okay, so what am I as a human bringing to this? Like, what can I add that's of net value? In the same way that, you know, if we look back, you know, you open an, you know, algebra book from the 1800s, if you can get your hands on one, and there are these elaborate calculations people are doing that, you know, was an incredibly skilled creative activity. You know, you cancel, you found a common factor in this, you know, three variable cubic equation. You canceled things out. It was very elegant. You solved it. Wolfram Alpha does all of this. You, you could not publish a paper now in which you solved some polynomial equation because people would say, why didn't you just plug this into Wolfram Alpha? And we, we could either lament the fact that we don't get to do that as humans anymore, or we could say it's a provocation. Like, we need to do something that takes that as a given, takes that as rote and tries to build on top of it. And I think LLMs have sort of raised the waterline in some sense and saying, okay, okay, a bunch of other things now start to look more rote than they did five years ago. And what is that, what's now incumbent upon us to, to, to try building on? Great. Was there one more question here? Uh, there is one, yes. Hi, I'm Bid, a PhD student from Edinburgh. I wanted to, ask about a term that Professor Martin Weller from the Open University in the UK coined, the age of information abundance. He claims that we used to live in the age of information scarcity, where trying to find something that was relevant to you would be difficult because you might have to physically travel to another country or go through immense barriers to get access to it. Nowadays, the problem is kind of the inverse. It's easy to find something relevant but finding something that you actually need is difficult because it might be buried under piles and piles of information. Um, so it's sort of like the difficulty of accessing information you need was at first difficult and it got easier over time and now it's getting more difficult again. I would even argue that generative AI is increasing the amount of content that we have available so much that this might go through the roof. Approaches to this um, seem to range from let's destroy the web and go back to information scarcity, uh, to let's have AI agents interact with the web on users' behalf, and now we have 
people asking an agent to do something that will use a tool to do something that will interact with information produced by agents that do something. So on a spectrum of AI does everything for us versus, you know what, let's give up on the whole thing. Where do you stand? <laughs> It's an it's awesome question. You get the award for the, <laughs> the funniest question. Um, so, so I would argue that today, the, the, the fact that we have, yes, we have information abundance, but uh, actually, the, you know, looking into the, you know, for the, let's say looking for the precise information in whatever is relevant is something that humans have become, or search users have become pretty good at. Actually, the LLM, LLMs saw that. They are very good at pinpointing and giving you the stuff in there that was hidden. But the problem that because now, because we have hallucination, you're not sure it's the correct answer. And because you miss the context, then you have no tool to try to infer and to build your own judgment. So if we are talking about this curve that you were describing that I kind of like, I think we, we were getting better, better, better with the LLMs. We could give even better, but now it's with uncertainty. And our entire world now is, is not deterministic. That, you know, we were discussing that before. One of my big, big worries in the evolution of uh, Gen AI, that we all, you know, computer scientists, you know, you have a scientific background, you're used to stuff being totally deterministic. When you do a proof, it's a proof that the truth, you get an output from an LLM, it's not the truth, it's not. And so people expect the same quality as what they're used to, and then they, they live in a kind of fuzzy world, and, and that scares me a lot, because I love, you know, maybe it becomes an art, maybe we are not computer scientists, we are computer artists, I don't know. But, you know, the, the, the ground is moving. So in your, in your curve, I'm somewhere, just before falling, I would say, I'm scared by the uncertainty. I'm super scared because I don't know to how to work with uh, undeterministic settings. I, I want a proof, and, and I lost that. Oh, good. I, since I've been agreeing with everything you've been saying so far, I get, I, get, I get to disagree a little bit. I feel like there are a lot of cases in our everyday lives, even in skilled professions, where this kind of non-determinism and error... I mean, let me just take the example of visiting a doctor. I have some medical condition, I go visit a doctor. And yes, there's medical training that kind of uniformizes some of what they're saying, but each doctor you visit is gonna tell you something slightly different. They're gonna actually, they, they were distracted while you were telling them the crucial part of your symptoms, they kind of missed it, now they're kind of filling it back in. Like, you know, they, so I, I think like, at least as humans, we're familiar with the idea that we're gonna get a different answer, each of us is gonna get a slightly different answer. Um, but it, it is a fascinating, but, but I, yeah, I think the question you're bringing up is, it's a fascinating tension. And I, I think to the point of abundance, um, I mean, obviously I'm a huge fan of the abundance problem. It, you know, early papers that I wrote talked about abundance in paragraph one. And I, I remember being kind of surprised years later to discover this book by Herb Simon, written the year I was born, right, in the early 1970s, where he's, he laments the fact that this is the early 1970s, there's just so much information now, we can't possibly, you know, and, we, and we, we often think of that as the era of scarcity, like, like that's the era that we're looking back to, that there's so much information we can't possibly process it, and you know, and sort of, he was writing about the economics of, of attention, and he said, if there's an abundance, abundance of one resource always implies a scarcity of some other resource, and usually that's the resource that, it, you know, if A is abundant, you have to look at what is A consuming, that must be scarce, right? If there's an abundance of, you know, um, you know, wolves, there are fewer deer because that's what they consume. And so, well, what is all this abundant information consuming? We, we all know what that is. It's human attention, and so that, that becomes the scarce resource. And and again, a kind of trope that we're all very familiar with from we can find lots of papers at the web conference that say this. It was sort of striking to see Herb Simon saying this verbatim in the in the early, early 1970s in an era that we thought of as sort of much simpler in its information content. January. Okay, well, maybe let's, um, let's, let's touch on trust and safety, because I think it's quite important that we not, uh, we not, we not miss this out. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of questions here. There's, there's privacy questions around um, uh, the, the, the users. There's uh, concerns from enterprise and, and uh, government uh, standpoint. There's, um, there's questions about, like, where 
LLMs may actually be hosted depending on the nature of content. Certain sectors are regulated in, in uh, healthcare, finance, cer certain um, sectors have, have very high uh, concerns about data, data security. Um, these, are, these are trust questions of, of, about both um, the infrastructure and the, and the uh, <coughs> providers. Um, and and uh, and then there's a family of techniques that are, are kind of here to go after these questions. So maybe um, maybe I, I can just start this very open ended and ask if uh, if everybody could kind of share thoughts about what are the most acute problems from a trust and safety standpoint. And and Jia covered a little bit. So maybe would you be open to start the? Uh... So. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think this AI yeah, safety is very important. So, so I know that the United Nations actually also has a committee, uh, in particular, discuss uh, the regulation of AI about the AI safety and also security. So, um, personally, I think it's very necessary to to d d design such kind of like a regulation. And also, on the other hand, I think te technology is also very important. For example, OpenAI has a super alignment project, and also. Recently, actually, researchers from university and also institute also talk about like a self-instruct and also self-improvement, improvement and also self-reflection, and even some somehow like a self-reflection. So I think I think one way is that you probably we could have built some some common model to check to check the the, the, the trust or safety of the of the different large language model. Well, on the other hand, actually, last time uh, I was, uh, when I talk about this, I was also challenged by the <laughs> Joshua Benjo. He said that, okay, so if the AI in the future will be smarter than us, how can we guarantee that we design some kind of technology which can, can make us safe? So, <laughs> so that's another angle. So, but anyway, we, we, I think it's still very necessary to design such kind of like a self instructive or self some, some kind of technology to, to, to make sure about the idea. Well, both, both ways are very important. So regulation and also technologies. So it's, yeah. I, I, I would say, you know, to answer your question, Andrew, I, I would say that it's super important that we, um, we keep developing, and I'm sorry if I'm doing a little bit of self-promotion for my new company, but I think we need to, to keep have, have, having many open source LLMs. We need to have this uh, diversification. We cannot have one or two big owners in that space. It was less dangerous with the web search engines because we would always come back to an open source and people could check, even if you could, there could be a bias and maybe you were missing stuff but there was still open access for the rest. I think here you really, really need to have as many open source, uh, uh, and kudos to Google for doing Gemma, uh, you know, but you have, of course, Falcon that you forgot to mention, you have Mistral, you have quite a few others, you have ChatGLM from this morning, but you need to keep as many open source LLM over there. We need to have different opinions, right? To make sure that it's not just one opinion ring for everyone. And I think for many sensitive uh, um, you know, segments that you were mentioning, they will not tr trust even uh, VPCs, you know, virtual private clouds. They would say, okay, let's bring that in house. They will probably have less good quality than if it was a humongous models, but they will somehow be able to to be reassured. And, and it's probably healthy to have uh, some diversification. And even if the quality is not uniform, I, I, you know, I want a pluralist world. I don't want one opinion everywhere. So I want this, like, and that's again what I, not what I predict, but what I want here. Yeah, and I think one principle about powerful tools is they tend to amplify whatever power imbalances already exist in the, in the world, right? And, power belts as they exist in society. And right, I think as LLMs are trained on, on text that sort of reflects all, all of our biases and all the historical inequalities, at one level it's going to bring about these sort of representational problems. It's representing the world in this biased way, but it sort of then almost grows into an allocational problem because as we increasingly sort of rely on these things as sources of advice, proxies for decision making, then actually potentially the flow of resources itself tends to follow that, which I think is another thing to then, then become careful about. Yeah. I'm sorry, I agree with you. <laughs> okay, so I think we're at the end of, uh, of time. So maybe I can just uh, thank the audience and thanks to the panelists very much for, for all the thoughts. Thank you.